Welcome to my monthly update on the alternative asset uh, industry. Uh, my name is George Evans from Convergence. Convergence is a data and analytics firm focused on the asset management industry globally. Today, I'll be joined by some terrific guests from KPMG. Uh, and uh, after that uh, discussion, I will give some comments on our uh, monthly lead tables, which look at market share in the fund admin audit prime broker and custodian world. So uh, thank you for joining us today. I want to welcome two terrific uh, guests today, uh, Joe Fisher and John uh, Budzina. Joe is a senior partner in KPMG's asset management group. Uh, John is the national leader for market development in the alternative space for KPMG. Uh, KPMG, a longstanding client of uh, Convergence. We've had a terrific relationship with you guys, and I want to welcome you both uh, to uh, to today's episode. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, George. Thanks, George. All right. So let me start with uh, with you, Joe. Uh, uh, my, my first question would be around uh, um, some of the major themes impacting the alternative fund industry in 2022. So curious uh, how if you could take us through how you know how and what KPMG views as kind of the major themes that you're seeing as we're kind of you know halfway through the year. Well, first of all, George, thank you. Thank you for hosting this with, with KPMG, and, and we value our relationship and look really look forward to future collaboration. You know, George, the alternative investment industry has thrived over, through what I would call a remarkable period in history over the last two years, truly unprecedented. It has adapted well to what's called a new working environment, albeit remote or hybrid pivoted to adapting to new technologies, digital, data centralization, outsourcing technologies, outsourcing in general. George, just think about it. Even the way we communicate, which used to be through live meetings and email and phone calls went to Zoom and Microsoft Teams. The industry has been extremely resilient to changes in capital allocations, capital raising, for instance, this is the first time we noticed that the investor relations folks were paramount to raising capital in a virtual environment. Matt, just think about doing virtual due diligence in this environment. The industry has innovated to meet investor demands. And now I'm talking about customization. We've seen an increase in side letters, transparency reporting, you know, fee allocations and by the way fees are charged, even structural variations. And now the industry braces itself for what I would call a, a, a new regulatory or potential regulatory rework driven by regulators in the US and abroad. Um, and finally, you know, this is a time and has been a time where investment managers are are truly studying their operating model, looking for efficiencies to enable future growth, all while monitoring and actually even protecting operating margins. George, a lot of things going on in the space right now, and there's a lot to look forward to. Well, you know, you mentioned one point, Joe, that I think is interesting, and we'll get into this a little bit later. But uh, just the, the the increased outsourcing, we've seen that, right, and we've seen firms that have been steadfast at keeping everything in-house, you know, as they're growing uh, and as they're, we're all fighting this kind of war on talent, right, which we'll talk a little bit about later, um, all of a sudden that that paradigm is shifting. So it's, it's creating, you know, great business opportunities for firms like yours, firms like ours uh, on, on that front. So uh, well said, I think uh, it's, a, it's a nice summary of, um, uh, you know, of uh, some of these uh, changes and themes. Let, and let me, me, just that outsourcing, yeah. you know, paradigm has been out there for a while, even pre-pandemic. And I think during the pandemic in this virtual environment, this remote environment, it really took center stage. And really people, you know, ideas and thoughts four years ago are truly coming to fruition now and taking and being taken more seriously. Yeah, agreed. Um, how, you know, you, you, we talk about this new kind of hybrid world of work, right? Uh, remote, three days in, three days out, uh, you know, two days out. 
Um, what's your view, Joe, on, on how the industry has reacted to that? And what are you seeing as kind of the major issues kind of at stake uh, in, the, in that new model uh, that, that is emerging? George, I think this is a, a great question, and it's 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 a tremendous testimonial to the industry to our industry that really centered on maintaining returns in volatile markets. The industry truly proved to be not only agile but resilient, very nimble. There are certain issues, George, that were recognized early that were critical to what's called success in a decentralized environment. One, it's technology. Operating you know, the tools available to make a seamless transition to a virtual transition. George, just thinking about this, not every employee had a, their own laptop they could bring at home. Within two, three days, that when you went remote, that had to get solidified and fixed. Um, the ecosystem in general, as we just talked about, reliance on service providers, collaboration, you know, understanding not only the, the importance of information flow from investment to treasury to other operational matters affecting the industry, but how about even uh, a firm's industry, but how about even talking about teaming, you know, the front office working together, making decisions. You know, sometimes there are, you know, a lot of firms have weekly investment meetings. Now they had to be done virtually. Um, how about just the teaming and the collaboration between not only operations, but the back office? Um, culture. Culture is another example. Um, we did a study, KPMG in, a co in conjunction with AMA, and culture and losing and, and diluting a firm's culture are one of the the, the key issues that firms were worried about losing during this, this, this remote slash hybrid environment. How do you make, really, how do you maintain the attributes that made a firm successful? And then the, now let's really focus on, on, on one thing that's front and center, this war for talent. And this is what I think is taking center stage and almost table stakes in this, what we would call a hybrid environment. We all heard of the great resignation, the great reshuffle. There is a war out there and a war for talent. And it's really, how do you attract, not only attract, but retain professionals? Uh, we could talk about, you know, firms giving out raises, bonuses, retention bonuses, uh, talk about, you know, flexibility. Um, you know, the employees right now are really, to be honest, you're in the driver's seat. Um, you know, if you look at, if you look at, you know, just in general, and I'll talk hypothetical, uh, a, a firm's professional staff, you have 20% say are the, the younger people that want to be back in the office. You have 20% of the senior, you know, senior executive pool, those, that, the top individuals want to be back in the office. You have that remaining 60% that are craving this hybrid environment and you got to strike a happy balance to be successful um again the the employees are um in the driver's seat now with having said that you know working in a what i would call this this hybrid environment one of the key things the firms are going to have to do if they want to maintain two three days a week in the office you have to set some protocols some protocols for you know, Teams meetings, for the Zoom calls, you need to be reachable. If you're working remotely, doesn't mean you're taking the day off. You, know, you, you need to be available during, and trust me on this, you need to be available during business hours. Um, you can't you know, respond to an email three hours later. If a client needs something, you better be able to respond. So there needs to be some type of protocols, even something you know, as simple as during work hours, you need to be on, on Zoom camera. So, you know, that's going to be a, a, a key out there if we continue this hybrid environment, which I do think we will in the foreseeable future. Now, again, I said employees are in the driver's seat. You know, an open question I have, George, really is, what happens if there's a recession? Does that pendulum swing back to the middle? 
Um, and for it, and I think it, it, it potentially does, and you'll see pe less people potentially reshuffling and resigning. But uh, for their sake, I hope it's not akin to a LIFO inventory system, meaning last in and, and first out. So Yeah, just real quick, I'll make a quick point on that um, um, before you finish your comments here. You know, I do think uh, we were talking about that the other day with someone that that pendulum could swing and and uh, uh, with a recession that 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 people aren't going to maybe have the latitude uh, that they have today. And I think we see people having different issues. We, we have a client uh, who, who's a large fund administrator who's, believe it or not, his problem is uh, everyone assumes this is just the. The millennial, right? Uh, the problem is the 42 and three and four year old who's got a beach house, right? Who wants to work from the beach house for the summer, right? And doesn't want to come in the office, right? So everybody's got little different uh, challenges, um, but clearly, uh, it's it's a the war for talent is is a is a new challenge, uh, and uh, I, I think you you know what you've said is 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 spot on. I think this economy could impact uh you know the, the way this plays out over the next couple of years let me just add a comment if i will george um i think the alternative firms also had to come to grips with whether they could uh fight this war for talent by accessing uh folks in disparate geographical regions or, or do they insist more on the collaboration and the teaming and the, and the things that are important to them as culture and so there's a little balance between um, having somebody who's not close to your home office and hire them. And the other two things we saw is that the demand was in, you know, um, data scientists uh, because of the front office technologies that's been deployed throughout a lot of these firms. And also, as Joe mentioned, the ever growing importance of investor relations. And so that's probably the number one uh, search uh, that's taking place in the alternatives industry right now. Yeah, agreed. And, and George, I'd be remiss without talking about you know what's happening right now, and I think firms are going to continue to reevaluate their real estate footprint by thinking what from what individuals and professionals are really core to the operating model and building a footprint around that. So I think that's another chapter that that is still being that is still being written. But, you know what's interesting about that point, Joe, is you know the 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 big four uh, were probably the first ones to get out in front with that whole hoteling concept uh, many years ago, right? And it's 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 funny how that's starting to play out a little bit now in terms of you know what kind of office space do you really need, right? To to your point. And, and and what John alluded to too, you know, let's look at the optimistic things about about the the war for talent. It expanded the talent pool. Can you look yeah. for talent in other geographies? Again, that has another impact on on your on your real estate footprint. But yeah. but to, to 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 really summarize, what are some of the, the 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 critical themes here in this decentralized environment? Is really maintaining a firm's culture, and again, that is paramount the continued collaboration and the resources and war for talent. Yep, agreed. So, so John, in your role, um, and I know you kind of just made a, a quick point on, on, on one of the points Joe made, but when you think about the, the list Joe kind of put together, in your role, what do you view as the most significant uh, trends that have impacted kind of your, you know, your, your day to day? Sure. Um, thanks, George. You know, look, uh, of course, no industry, um, not just the alternative industry, the entire investment management industry, um, you can't really talk about success without talking about the impact that technology has on the front and back office of these firms. And that's really what's shaping the sector. I think if you look at alternative firms, there are the, the, the predominant amount of the spend is in the front office. Uh, using, you know, I would say artificial intelligence tools, the digital transformation that, um, that Joe spoke about in terms of the outreach to the investors. And we saw during this decentralized environment over the last two years, the importance that the whole data centralization uh, and the aggregating of, of centralized data 
formats where folks could access information and because they didn't have the access that they normally would have in an office to the individuals that they, they would normally get information from and, and working off a common base was really key. Um, obviously, the technology on all levels is shaping the front office. We, we see it with the AI data sets, um, but cybersecurity for, uh, really is the, is the one concern out there that is a constant threat to all these proprietary strategies and, and their portfolios. Um, but so that would be technology clearly uh, number one, but also equally driving the growth in the industry is the, this unparalleled demand from investors for customized portfolio construction, as opposed to you just join my flagship fund, this is what I have to offer. We're being very, very specific as to what we want. Uh, and we're being very, very specific in the form we want it. It could be, spe you know, it could be separately managed accounts. It could be co-investment strategies. It could be a particular jurisdiction uh, with a particular uh, tax motivation. And so obviously all of those things, if you, if you subscribe to that, you create a tremendous amount of operational complexity that has to, that, that is not easily scaled. And then because of the pandemic as well, new strategies emerged in the private credit, the hybrid PE hedge world. All of that was not as much of a cookie cutter in terms of, in terms of operations as well. So I see all of these factors uh, that in catering to the investor in this environment uh, is putting a tremendous amount of pressure on the existing operating models of, of these firms. Yeah, thanks, John. I think that's a, a well said and a, and a good summary. So Joe, back to you, right? This, this industry continues to grow. Um, you know, certainly we're seeing, uh, you know, very significant growth, a specific, you know, pr particularly on the, on the closed end side. Um, uh, I wanted you to talk a little bit about catalysts that are emerging these days and, and things that you see that could uh, impact, I guess, the, the trajectory of, of this alternative industry. Thanks, George. You know, it, it may be a little too premature to predict, but there are some regulatory headwinds out there that I think will come to manifest itself in some shape or form in the next uh, couple of months. You know, talking about the private funds a uh, rule proposal which talks about quarterly statements and disclosures, annual audits, fairness opinions on secondaries and, and prohibitions on certain, let's call it preferential, preferential treatment of, of investors, just to name a, a, a few. This is going to put uh, more, more stress on the operating model uh, specifically compliance and, and, and operations. You have the dealer rule proposals out there, potential AIFMD changes. And I'd be, again, remiss to not talk about ESG and ESG guidance. Um, ESG has taken front and center um, uh, relevance on a due diligence questionnaire. And there is a need to have the disclosures and be able to answer those questions, but be able to answer, answer those questions in a truthful and honest manner and not being misleading. You're seeing the ESG disclosures take a form in the public sector right now, uh, public companies, and they most likely will make their way uh, to the private funds world, but they are on almost every deep due diligence questionnaire right now. So really answering those truthfully and honestly and in a, let's call it consistent fashion. And I think you're gonna see some more rule sets with ESG and consistency. So investors can, can, can you know, compare one fund to another. And then crypto right now, crypto has exploded in the last, let's call it six months. And I think there's going to be you know, coming out, there's, I know there's a FASB project right now, but there's going to be some more governance around, around crypto, and that'll take some shape and form. You know, I know the crypto market um, has been in, in the tank for the last, uh, let's call it two, two months, uh, and it's been extremely volatile, but there will be some accounting guidance coming out there uh, for crypto. 
I'd also be just talking about, you know, catalyst and trajectory, you know, I'd be remiss, you know, not talking about some economic factors. You know, do we have a recession looming? Um, how bad are our, our, our funds below their high watermark right now? And what returns are they going to have to get to get paid to carry or incentive? So these things are, are looming as well that I think affect the trajectory. All, all you know, keeping in mind and monitoring what I said earlier is the operating margins. All investment managers to be successful right now have to have an eye on monitoring and creating efficient operating models to uh, maintain a margin. So I think, uh, you know, all of these will have some type of far reaching impact on the industry and its ability to really sustain itself in the current construct. Yeah, I, uh, thanks, Joe. Um, J John, uh, just a, a little deeper dive on some of those comments. I was wondering if you could elaborate on maybe some of the changes you might expect from, from, you know, from your lens. Sure. Um, let me start. Um, look, I, I, going back to the business operating model, whether it's the fee compression that we've been dealing with for years, the war for talent that you gentlemen just, you know, uh, eloquently uh, discussed, uh, the demands for investors that we spoke about, the regulatory headwinds that, that Joe enumerated. I mean, they're, they're on the horizon. Every one of those has constraints on margins. And so while performance has really been healthy over the last couple of years, um, these matters that they suggest a sort of a reassessment of the business operating model of the future and, and, and for the industry. So I think uh, folks will begin to look at the lessons learned from the pandemic and carry forward and try to shape an efficient business operating model. Yeah. Joe, your thoughts on, on, that, on, those, on those few quick comments? No, I, I, I think that John is correct. Um, as with, you know, all industries, the alternative investment fund industry will really begin its evolution to its own maturity. Firms out there are going to have to think what functions are core to their success. And I'm talking about keeping inside insourcing and potentially forming joint ventures with technology companies, outsourcing certain functions to the ecosystem, new product development, all this will drive, drive innovation. So the, I, I do believe this industry, and it's really a, a testament to the success over the last two years, has really been agile and, and resilient, nimble, and was able to keep on going, so. Um, all right, well, well said again, and, uh, you know, we continue to look at the ecosystem, right? Uh, the service provider view and uh, uh, still in drastic need of consolidation, right? As you guys know, there are over 600 administrators, 500 audit firms, 300 primes and about 1400 custodians. So while you have the 80-20 rule, uh, we continue to think ripe for consolidation, ripe for innovation, right? And, and uh uh, so I want to thank you both uh, for joining me. A really good, solid discussion with two uh, real pros in the market. So, gentlemen, uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for the relationship you have with us, uh, and uh, and thank you for uh, for joining me today. Our pleasure, George. Thank you, George. So again, I want to thank our guests from KPMG, and I thought I'd make just some concluding remarks around. Uh, uh, market growth that we're seeing uh, in the, uh, the, the service provider uh, industry. I'm going to start with fund administrators. Over the last year, so that would be really um, uh, May to May, right, uh, 21 to 22, we actually on the, uh, 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 on the fund administration front, you know, we saw fund growth of um, uh, almost 16 percent and uh, uh, and when we started to look at that uh, within uh, uh, the fund administration industry, we saw admins ranked uh, one to five um, uh, increase at 25%. So substantially over that 16%. Uh, we saw six to 10 grow just about at that clip, 16%. And we saw admins 11 to 25 grow at 21%. And all other admins, and bear in mind there are over 600, Grew at just about five percent. So um, uh, clearly, uh, we're seeing in this last year on the fund side, um, 
very significant growth uh, market market level or better uh, in that top 10. When I take that same conversation to uh, to auditors, uh, uh, again, that 16% fund growth over the last year, we saw the big four really grow at about 8%. Uh, and we saw auditors five to 10 grow at about 28%. And we saw auditors uh, 11 to 25 grow at about 27%. And all other auditors grow at about 14%. So everyone uh, outpaced uh, the market with the exception of the big four. Um, on the fund side, uh, very significant growth um, uh, in the five to 25 uh, space uh, from an audit perspective. When I look at prime brokers and look at that same kind of growth, fund growth, um, you know, we saw prime brokers one to 10 growing at a little over 4%, uh, 11 to 25 growing at close to 7% and all others, um, you know, growing at about 13%. There's a large growth number that's unattributed to certain primes, right? Um, so again, uh, my comment here would be, um, you know, growth at about half the market uh, for that uh, part of the prime uh, uh, industry. And then lastly, I just want to make those same comments about custodians. We saw growth there of close to 15% with uh, custodians uh, uh, 1 through 10, the top 10, growing at about 11%, uh, 11 to 25, only growing uh, about 1.5%, and all other custodians growing uh, uh, in excess of the market at about 16.5%. So interesting point there is uh, kind of 1 through 10 and uh, uh, 26 plus kept pace with the market growth, um, 11 to 25 did not. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining me as usual. I really enjoyed our guests today from KPMG. Uh, I look forward uh, to uh, all of our clients and prospects uh, spending some time with us, looking at our league tables, understanding uh, how we decompose the market and can really show you um, how you and your peers and competitors are growing in the market. Um, thank you all. Have a great uh, 4th of July and uh, thanks for uh, making the time today. Bye-bye.